This is the Milo Beasley Show. This is the Milo Beasley Show. There's only one thing you need to know. This is the Milo Beasley Show. And now, here's your host, Milo Beasley. And welcome to the Milo Beasley Show. Do 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 do. This week, you know what I. I just want to say thank you to everybody watching the Milo Beasley show this week and, and in past weeks and the past seven years. That's right. This is our seven year anniversary show. This is our 300th episode. That's right. 300 episodes of the Milo Beasley show. If you go back and watch that first episode, you're going to say, how did they make it 300 episodes? But thank you for all who have watched throughout this last seven years in I couldn't be more happy for our guest this week. So please help me welcome at this time, Disney legend, absolute Disney legend. And that's not just like a fake name. He is an actual Disney legend. Please help me welcome at this time, Floyd Norman. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of yours. So thank you very much for chatting with me. But one of the things that I have to know from an early from an early point in your life, yeah, you were growing up prior to working with the Disney company. Were you a fan of the Walt Disney cartoons? And if so, what was your favorite Disney movie? Well, I was a fan of animation, of course, uh, Walt Disney Studios in particular, but uh, I, I loved all the animated uh, films, shorts, features, TV shows. Uh, I was just a huge animation devotee, you know, and uh, I, I, I decided when I was in middle school that I would be, upon graduation, I would be headed for the Walt Disney Studios. So my, my, my mind was made up even when I was a kid. So is that when, so in middle school, is that, is that when you realized that you had that passion for art? And then when did that passion for art turn into the passion for animation? Oh, I think it all happened around the same time. I, I think I had been drawing as a kid, as all kids do, you know, a lot of drawing and coloring books and that kind of thing. But it, it was really in middle school where uh, I had this epiphany and I knew pretty much this was what I was going to be doing with the rest of my life. That's awesome. I wish I, I, yeah. wish I knew in middle school what I was going to do with the, with the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. I think it's rather rare that most kids uh, at that point in their life have little idea what they're going to do as an adult. But for me, it was uh, as clear as anything that I would be working in this particular field. I just immediately connected to it and fell in love with it. Is there, was there a particular film that just, that made it click or was it just like, just the broad scope of everything? Oh my, it was the broad scope of everything. Uh, I just love the medium. I guess if anything, I fell in love with the medium of animation. And maybe that's because animation embodied so many of the things I loved. Uh, it embodied storytelling, uh, art, uh, music, uh, cinematography. Uh, all these things were interests of mine, and uh, everything seemed to come together with the, the animated medium and uh, making motion pictures using animation. That's, that's so great. And so how does one, right out of you know school, go and apply at the Walt Disney Company at that time? <laughs> that's a that's a, that is a very good question because that is pretty much what I did. Uh, once graduating from high school, uh, I think I was uh, this was back in 1953. I was 17 years old, just graduated from Santa Barbara High School. Uh, I drove down to the Walt Disney Studios, which was conveniently only. 90 miles away, didn't have to travel across the country, uh, only uh, about a, uh, a 90 minute drive down the California coast to 
to Hollywood, to Los Angeles, to to the Valley, and and the Walt Disney Studio. And so I um, managed to, through a uh, a personal friend, uh, get a, a meeting at the Disney Studio. <laughs> and I went down. I went down for my first, uh, you might say, informal interview. The studio was not even open. Uh, the studio was closed on weekends, and I went down on a Saturday morning oh, man. when there was studio was pretty much empty. You know, employees, maybe a handful of maintenance people, and a few people were in the building, but not many. So I had my interview on a day the studio was actually closed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What are the chances? Yeah. Did you know that it was closed when you went there? Or did you show up and like, oh, no, it's everything. There's nobody here. Well, you know, I knew that it was uh, the weekend. So I, I already knew that chances are that the studio would be closed, you know, uh, <laughs> except for, uh, you know, a handful of people there. So I, I realized it was Saturday and the studio was closed weekends. So I knew that I would be. Uh, but again, that didn't deter me. Uh, after all, I was getting the opportunity to go on to the Walt Disney Studio, uh, something that was extremely rare in those days, because back in the day, studios did not allow visitors to come on to their, their studio property. I mean, it was pretty much a closed world to the general public. So by my having the opportunity to go to Disney, even if the studio was closed, it was still a marvelous opportunity. Absolutely. And then what was Sleeping Beauty, your first film that you worked on with the Disney company? It was uh, my first feature film. Oh, and feature. Uh, that, did, that didn't come easy because you, you could not work on the features unless you had proven yourself on lesser fare. Uh, you had to make your way up, sort of climb the ladder, working on right. TV shorts and short cartoons and other things. Uh, things that would be considered less taxing to the artist. And then if you were truly qualified to do, you know, the uh, higher quality work, then you would get to work on the feature film. But you had to prove that you were able to do to do the job. Absolutely. And then, so yeah. how, uh, is it just climbing the ranks, climbing the ranks? How did you how did you come to work directly with and under Walt Disney on the Jungle Book? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, uh, they, they assume that, wow, how in the world did this young kid manage to attract the attention of Walt Disney? And I have to remind people that this did not happen overnight. I had literally been working at the Walt Disney Studio for a decade before Walt Disney even knew I was there. Oh, so keep I, in I think mind that's that. a huge misconception. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. People think, oh, wow, you, you, you had the opportunity to work with Walt Disney. But keep in mind, I had been working at the studio for over a 10-year period when I, I came to the attention of Walt Disney. So it wasn't overnight. I was not an <laughs> overnight. <laughs> I was not an overnight discovery. You know, uh, oftentimes we think of people who are overnight successes. Well, that, that overnight can be a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So how did, how did Walt end up discovering you or discovering your work? Or are you getting your stuff in front of Walt to be chosen? Well, that's a story all by itself. <laughs> now, Walt Disney's daughter, Walt Disney's eldest daughter, Diane Disney Miller, and the conversation we had once reminded me that her father, Walt Disney, was uh, a gag man. And Walt considered himself the best gag man in the Disney studio, which meant Walt Disney had a particular affection for funny cartoon gags. He loved gags. He loved humor. Well, it just so happened that I had been drawing gags because it was just a pastime of mine. I did it not because it was my job. I did it in my spare time. And it was done to, you know, uh, take jabs at my fellow, uh, <laughs> my fellow employees. And on occasion, sometimes even at the Disney management. Well, in the 1960s, a, there was a marvelous technology that came on the market called the photocopy process, Xerox. And because of Xerox, 
you could take one drawing that used to be just one drawing and you could duplicate it multiple times. Well, <laughs> all these all these cartoons that I drew were duplicate were duplicated using using Xerox. And consequently, they ended up all over the Walt Disney Studio. Well, naturally, if they were all over the Disney Studio, guess who saw them? Right. Walt, Dis Walt Disney saw them, yeah. And so Walt, once again, uh, being taken in by these funny gags, said, hey, who's drawing these funny cartoons? And uh, my, my uh, supervisor said, well, that was, you know, that's this kid in the animation department. He, he's doing those gags. And Walt said, well, he, he, he doesn't belong in animation. He belongs in the story department. Oh, and wow. that's how I got that's how I got in Walt Disney's story department wow. by by not even trying to get in. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. Yeah, that's something. Do you have a favorite <laughs> while we're talking about Walt? Do you have a favorite Walt story? Well, there are so many. Uh, I, I often joke about it. And, and I do this sometimes on college campuses uh, where I where I often uh do lectures on Walt Disney, on the man himself. I, I do a, uh, I've been doing a regular lecture at the University of Southern California for about the past five years. I've been lecturing uh, on Walt Disney because there are so many stories to tell. I, so it's difficult to, <laughs> it's difficult to choose, to choose one story when there are so many Walt Disney stories. But I'll, I'll, I'll choose one. Uh, as an example, we were uh, showing a visitor uh, around the Walt Disney Studio lot one one uh, noontime. Visitors were allowed on the Disney Studio campus at lunchtime, but only lunchtime back in those days. You could come in for an hour and have a tour of the studio if you knew somebody who worked inside. Well, we had a visitor, uh, a missionary from Africa a little old woman who was visiting from Africa and we were showing her around the Walt Disney studio. And she wondered if by chance, uh, if she might have the opportunity to meet Walt Disney. And we said, well, that'd be nice, but we, we doubt that might happen because Walt Disney was a very busy man. And I doubt if he would have time to speak with, with a visitor, with a random visitor, you know, because nothing had been prearranged. Well, as luck would have it, guess who comes walking past? Walt Disney himself. <laughs> so, so we introduced Walt Disney to the little old woman who was a missionary from Africa. And Walt was fascinated by this woman. And he spent the next hour talking with this woman because he found out that she was a missionary, that she lived in Africa, and she knew all about the African fauna and uh, flora. And he wanted to get as much information as he could from this woman. Walt was that kind of a guy. He was extremely inquisitive. He wanted to know everything. And if you had something to offer, you had something he didn't know, he would put aside business affairs and, 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 spend, and happily spend an hour or so talking with you because he wanted to know. He wanted to learn. That's... That's absolutely incredible. Uh, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I kind of feel the same way about people and uh, uh -huh. I'm glad I get a chance to talk to you and, and, and learn from you. Uh, you know, and he seems like he was only a, a once in a lifetime type person, except if you yeah. count Tom Hanks uh, in Saving <laughs> Mr. Banks. What did you think about Tom Hanks's performance in Saving Mr. Banks? It's funny you should mention that because uh, I, I um, one day I was at my desk at the Disney studio in Glendale and I received a phone call from one of uh, Tom's assistants saying that, uh, would you, would you mind coming over to the Walt Disney studio a lot? Uh, Mr. Hanks would like to speak with you. And so of course, <laughs> get a call from Tom Hanks. Right. Even though it was from his assistant, you immediately drop what you're doing. You get in your car and you drive. It's a short 10 minute drive from Glendale to Burbank because they were shooting Saving Mr. Banks at the Burbank studio lot, uh, a 10 minute drive down the road. So I, I drove down through to the studio in Burbank and uh, 
went to the set where they were filming Saving Mr. Banks and um, looked around, did, well, I saw the crew, I saw the cast and the crew, but I didn't see Tom Hanks. And I'm just sort of standing there uh, on, on the grass well, waiting for someone to, to come up to me. And I hear all of this shouting and bursting out of the door is Tom Hanks running toward me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you can imagine the, the if you can imagine the the, the shock, uh, the, what I felt to have a one of the one of Hollywood's biggest stars, and he's running toward me because he was so anxious to meet me. <laughs> I could, could not could not believe it. You would think, wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be the other way around? Should I be the one running towards Tom Hanks? <laughs> but but uh, he was so uh, eager to speak to me about the uh, about the, the the film and the role he was playing, and to get some particulars about uh, about the animation building, what it was like back in the 1960s, because after all, I was there. Yeah. Yeah. And about Walt Disney himself, uh, although he had. Uh, Tom had done his research. He knew a good deal about Walt Disney, but every little bit he could garner uh, made his performance that much better. So That's... we spent a, we spent about an hour together just talking about uh, P.L. Travers, Walt Disney, the Sherman Brothers, and what it was like back in the early '60s when they uh, were kind of like laying the foundation for making of the film Saving Mr. Uh, not Saving uh, Mary Poppins, right. and that's what Saving Mr. Banks is based on, the uh, the making of that film. That's incredible. That's incredible that he, even as you know, a, a world class actor, didn't yeah. take just you know wasn't like oh well I, I know what I'm doing. Went out and did research and found you and talked to you about it. That's incredible. Well, I, again, I was one of the many people that he talked to. He spent a good deal of time with Walt Disney's daughter, Diane Disney Miller. He he actually flew up to Napa Valley a couple of times to meet with Walt's daughter. He spoke with other uh, individuals who had been at the studio uh, back in the early 60s. Certainly, he spoke with Richard Sherman, one of the Sherman brothers, Right. who was uh, a, a big part of the story. And of course, uh, uh, some of the people, many of the people who were involved had since passed away. Right. So those few of us who were left, Tom um, made a point to uh, get to know everything he could about what happened back in the early 60s. That's incredible. Now, yeah. My wife and I were lucky enough to meet you and your wife, Adrian, in the Tampa Bay area at a, a small comic convention a few years ago. Uh, she was, oh. I, I, I had you draw oh. a Donald Duck pulling the sword out of the, uh, you know, from Sword in the Stone. Um, it was, <laughs> it was incredible, but she was also oh very my. vocal and influential in what you were doing while you were doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is it like working in the same field as your wife, who is also an artist for Disney? Well, kind of the good news is that we really don't do the same kind of work, although it is related. Uh, right. I, I work in animation, which means I'm involved in the motion picture side of things. And my wife is an illustrator who works in publishing. So she's more involved with books. So even though even though what we do is similar, even though what we do is Disney related, uh, we're not always uh, working together. Now, on occasion, and it does happen, we have collaborated on books. Uh, we've actually worked on storybooks together, but it, that that's rare. It doesn't happen often. And I'll tell you, I'm kind of glad it doesn't happen often because she is a tough taskmaster and I would rather work for somebody else because my wife is, uh, I would say, is too difficult to work for. <laughs> she was like, hey, make sure you <laughs> fill in this space. Make sure that all this is taken. Yeah, I could, I could see it. I could see it. She was oh, yeah, yeah. super nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to meet, you know, uh, I talked to her at the last D23 
just so, so, so nice. So, uh, oh. you know, glad I was able to, to chat with both of you guys. Uh, but yeah. I think she was, she was the, obviously the catalyst for you still showing up to Disney studios, even after you retired. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, in a way that kind of happened by accident because uh, my wife doesn't drive. So uh, that meant that meant I had to drive her to work every day. Well, you know, you do this on a daily basis and you you don't want to make that trip twice, you know, to drive her to work, drive back home, drive back to work, drive back home again. So I decided, well, you know what? As long as I'm driving her to work, I might as well wait here at the Disney studio until she gets off work and then we can drive we can drive home together. Why, why make the same trip twice? So I found a, uh, an office space at the Disney studio. And so I began to just uh, every day, I would drive my wife to work. I would, I would go to my office space and work there all day until it was time for her to go home. And then we would drive home. And that went on for weeks. It went on for months. And it went on for years. <laughs> So you're not really retired, retired. You're more like retired, wink, wink. Yeah. Well, you know what? Even though I formally retired from the Walt Disney Company as an employee, right. I, never, I never cut off that relationship with the Walt Disney Company. And I'm even involved with Disney today. Uh, no longer an employee. <laughs> but it seems that we're always working together on something. Uh, I've done so many different projects. Uh, only a week ago, I was uh, out uh, filming with uh, four, four again, for the Walt Disney Studios. I was out filming. I can't tell you what I was filming just yet. But, but I'm still very much involved with the Disney company and continue this relationship, this long, long relationship that began so many years ago, it continues to this day. So much so where only week or, a week or so ago, I was out filming a movie for the Walt Disney Studios. Now, uh, so you're, you're, obviously you, you know, went from being an, an animator to a, a storyteller. Now, Walt was famous. It's been documented. It's been, it's been talked about that he would act out the scenes in front of the animators for like exactly how he wanted everything to be animated. Just, he would act everything out. Did, did you develop that same storytelling when you were working as a a story artist? Oh, no, indeed. No, no, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, And keep in mind, this was something Walt did as a young man. Right. Uh, when when Walt was much younger, he was uh, dynamic and energetic, and he would and and it's true the uh, the artists and the animators and the story people told me that Walt would uh, tend to put on a performance. He would act right. out the scene because he loved he loved doing that. Uh, as he began to uh, to grow uh, on in years, uh, Walt uh, was no longer that active and agile and. He spent uh, story meetings pretty much seated in his chair. It, it was rare that he would uh, get up out of his chair and, and, and do a bit of business. So I guess I, what I saw was the more, uh, you know, it was, was Uncle Walt, you know, was the, the older gentleman who would sit back and, and, and give his uh, advice. But uh, I, I never had the opportunity to see the young Walt Disney and to see his performance, but he, he right. certainly did do that. And many of the artists, the older artists who were there at the time, back in the thirties and forties, did say that Walt Disney was, uh, he would put on quite a show. <laughs> right. Uh, now, one thing I definitely want to talk to you about, you've been uh, outspoken. Uh, you've talked about it on your Facebook page. You've talked about it in your blog, and that is Song of the South. Why do you right. think that it is important for this film to not be hidden away in a film vault somewhere? Well, number one, it's, it's sort of, it, it, it's one of the Disney classic films. Uh, one of the films Walt Disney personally supervised. And on top of that, it is a 
it is a very it's it's a good solid disney film with 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 a good solid story great characters uh there were some who would argue that it's not one of disney's best but once again that's a matter of opinion i think it's a good film i enjoyed it as a child i enjoyed it as a young person a young adult and i enjoy it today uh i understand that the film deals with a rather sensitive subject it deals it deals with the american south after the civil war anybody who knows their american history knows that this was a very trying time in america's history this was reconstruction this was a very uh, dicey time in the history of the united states of america certainly the issues of slavery uh, which had just ended and and uh, blacks living in the south very very sensitive subject and walt disney was aware of the sensitivity of the subject matter so much so he called upon black activists such as clarence muse uh, a gentleman uh, actor director a gentleman i met uh, some years ago when he was still with us uh, clarence muse was an activist in hollywood and Walt Disney even consulted with Clarence Muse because he was concerned about the uh, sensitive nature of this particular motion picture. Having said all of this, I don't see any reason why this film should be locked away. There's nothing in it that I find uh, in poor taste, that I find detrimental in any way, shape or form. I'm, I've always been supportive of the film. I've never uh, regretted screening the film for audiences. And one of the things I did do some years ago was to actually screen Song of the South for an all African-American audience. Oh, wow. And no one, I repeat, no one took offense at the Walt Disney film. As a matter of fact, there were some who inquired if they might see it again. <laughs> they enjoyed the film. They enjoyed the film so much. So, and yet I understand the sensitive nature of the subject matter. But having said that, I'm still very much supportive of Walt Disney's Song of the South. And I do not consider the film racist in any manner. I never have. And uh, I think it's a film that should be seen. Sure, if young people have questions about the South during the period of Reconstruction, this is an opportunity to learn American history. I mean, why sweep history under the rug? Learn it, become familiar with it, educate yourself, because this is a very significant part of you know of the history of this nation. I I 100% agree. I I mean I wish they would leave it up to people to make their own decisions on what they right. want to watch and what they don't want to watch. But exactly, yeah, exactly. No one is. No one is saying that you have to watch the film, but no one should be telling you, and that includes the Walt Disney Company, by the way, no one should be telling you, you cannot watch the film. Right. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, so I, I would just want to ask, so what advice would you give to young animators trying to break out or be hired by Disney? Or is, is Disney even hiring classic animators anymore, or is it all uh, computer CGI now? Well, I would, I'm happy to say that art is still very much uh, alive and well at the Walt Disney Studio. Uh, a good example of this is I've been uh, listening to my wife because she's in her studio <laughs> next door to me here, here at home. <laughs> and she has been interviewing a number of uh, candidates for a position in Disney's art department. She is actively interviewing candidates for a job right now. So there are opportunities available even today. Uh, art hasn't left the Walt Disney Company. Uh, there is a need for artists, talented artists. And uh, I'm happy to say there will always be a need for talented artists at the Walt Disney Studio. Now, my wife happens to work in Disney Publishing. Right. So she is looking for a particular kind of artist. But keep in mind, uh, my field is animation art. And even though uh, 
uh, digital has become a very big part of our production process, artists are still needed. While it's true that we, we don't do traditional hand-drawn animation any longer, uh, there is still a need for talented artists who can draw. Absolutely. There, there will always be a need for artists, you know, even though we have the computer, computers can't draw and there'll always be a need for artists. Absolutely. All right. So before we wrap yeah. up, I have to ask a question that I ask every single one of my guests on my show. And that is Floyd Norman. What is your favorite movie quote? My favorite movie quote. Yes. <laughs> you mean, well, you mean you, it, one not, that you go to to the well when you're when in a random situation? Okay, and not not just Disney films. Not just in, no just, any any movie. This would be this would be any movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let me uh, let me go back to to George Lucas's uh, wonderful film Star Wars where one of the characters said, says, hey, I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> and I think that line, I think George used it in every one of his Star Wars films, Absolutely. where one of the characters, they'd be in a dicey situation and one of the characters would say, mm, I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> so so that's my, that's my go-to quote. Love it, and uh, I guess I guess it was such a favorite. I guess because George wrote it, maybe that's why he used it so much. But it's always been a favorite of mine. Uh, absolutely love it, Floyd. Thank yeah. you so much for chatting with me today. Uh, I I look forward to the day that we get to, you know, again say hi in person. But again, thank you so yeah. much for taking the time to chat with me today. You bet. I'm looking forward to to D23, uh, where we can once again get together in person. And, and uh, you know, uh, just come together as, as fans of Disney and, and the fact that we, we love this stuff and we celebrate it. And I, boy, it's been something I've missed being locked away at home this past year. And I'm looking forward to getting out again. Yes. Thank again. Thank you. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Thanks a lot. It's been my pleasure.